We're getting ready to get started here in just about uh, one or two minutes. So make your way in from the hallway in the lobby. Come on up front here to the seats. We're going to get this master course kicked off for you guys. I want to welcome everybody to the Aesthetic Management Partners first, Selenus Derma PRP uh, Master Training Course. Um, we're really excited to uh, be launching this product with everybody here in this room. Um, uh, we're excited about what Selenus Derma is. We're going to have a, a didactic portion. We're going to do a little lecture so we can kind of go over everything again. I know. Um, you're very talented sales reps, obviously, uh, got you in this room, so everybody's excited about it and you know, is a user of the product currently. But we're going to go over the science again. Um, we're going to do a live patient demo up here as well. And then we'll get to the hands-on portion. Um, the goal is to obviously get as many people as treated as we can through the hands-on portion. Um, but if you're not one of the ones who had uh, the privilege of being able to bring a patient to the hands-on, please be there at a station while the hands-on portion is going on. Um, this is, you know, kind of a, a watch and learn, very hands-on course. Um, ask questions. We have lots of mics at the tables um, for people to be able to ask questions with. Um, we want you to be incredibly comfortable at the end of this. Um, we have expert users who's been utilizing this product for quite some time. We have Dr. Lee Thornton. Um, he's a plastic surgeon out of Meridian, Mississippi. Um, we've got Dr. Peter Helton. He's board-certified dermatologist. You've probably seen him on the webinars. We also have, um, from Clear Skin Institute, Dr. Ann Watwood. Um, and we also have uh, Melissa Gibbons, a nurse practitioner as well, who's been uh, utilizing the product for quite some time. Am I missing anybody else? Um, uh, we've also, well, I think we have six different stations uh, ready to go with everybody. So um, really excited to get things started. Um, I want to introduce our, I believe, our first speaker. Um, is he in the room now? Yes, there he is. Dr. Peter Helton, a colleague and very good friend of ours here at Aesthetic Management Partners. A um, little background about uh, Dr. Helton. He's been practicing for, I believe, uh, almost as long as I've been alive, uh, so about, for about 34 years. Um, he has an esteemed background. I believe he started his career in uh, emergency medicine and then transitioned over to the dermatology field. Um, he runs a practice in Newport Beach, California where he practices mainly uh, you know, aesthetic dermatology and some clinical dermatology. He says he's about 70-30, mainly focused on aesthetics. Um, he's a master injector, he's a wide lift trainer, um, he's a really good uh, loyal customer and friend of ours, and he knows this product extensively. Um, so any kind of clinical questions, him and I have gone over a ton of the studies um, that, you know, that are behind this product, so he is a wealth of knowledge in the injection space, and we're happy to have him. Dr. Helton, come on up. <laughs> I want to bring up Dr. Lee Thornton. Um, introduction for Dr. Lee. Um, he's a UT Southwestern trained surgeon. He did his uh, fellowship in plastic surgery at Emory. Um, and then from there, he's gone on to do oculofacial plastics and you know, general plastic surgery uh, fellowships um, within his training. He runs, a, uh, um, he runs a plastic surgery practice in Meridian, Mississippi, uh, where he uh, 
Uh, it stays extremely busy, obviously, but uh, he's, a, again, another wealth of knowledge uh, in this space. We're very happy and lucky to have him here today, uh, being, being with uh, his background in plastic surgery, especially in occupational facial plastics as well. I want to go ahead and introduce and bring up our good friend, Dr. Lee Thornton. So. <laughs> So what they did around March is they called us all together, Lee, uh, me, Missy, and um, Anne, and they said we have this new product called Salinas PRP, what do you think about it? Um, and they gave it to us to play with. And what was cool about that is I'm a dermatologist, so I tried to use dermatological uses of it. Lee's worked a lot with um, fat transfers, so he, he has a, more of an in, invasive way of using it, I guess, than I would. Um, and Anne is purely cosmetics, and she's got a whole different way of doing it. So we, get, we got three different viewpoints on how this worked. And it's interesting, because even when we talk on the phone, we all use it just a little bit differently. Um, so we've only been using it probably about four months. There's other competing products on the market, mostly made out of Fibrin, PRF. Um, uh, I'm going to explain to you why PRP gel is probably the best choice for what we're using in the aesthetic arena. So do we, do we really need a new volumizer, a new filler? Uh, I mean, it's, uh, there's two of them that just get, are about to come out on the market. I think uh, Allergan's about to bring out its uh, skin poppers, and then um, we also have one for underneath the eyes. Um, but this is what I explain to people as far as, you know, they, they don't want to feel full. Um, you know, I don't, I don't want more filler in my face. Well, what happens is we're all along the spectrum here, somewhere along the line. We'd like to be somewhere in the middle, right? But we're all going to degrade and eventually uh, collapse into old age. So what happens as we, as we, uh, as we age is we, uh, we lose our foundation. Um, and when we lose our foundation, we need to have a, a little bit more volume in the foundation and in the surrounding tissue to, to compensate for it. Now. We're sort of failing in the aesthetic market. If you look at it um, from the point of view when a patient comes in, the very first thing the patient says is, I don't want to look funny, don't do too much, right? Um, you don't go to a Mercedes dealer and say, you know, don't give me the lemon, right? But the, the, very, the very five minutes of my initial consultations are all about how we do a natural technique and how we're going to make people look, you know, the way Courtney Cox should have looked. Um, and what happens is, uh, of the people that can afford filler um, and would benefit from it, 96% in the United States don't take advantage of it. So we're only doing 4% of the market um, with hyaluronic acid fillers right now. Um, so there, there is a need for changing our approach, um, for making it more um, integrative, uh, more regenerative, um, more subtle, um, just to make the patients uh, happier. So let's talk about what this is and where it can be used. So Salinas is an autologous volumizer, and it's basically um, based on uh, Salinas PRP, which has been around for about eight years. Um, it's a very unique process that uh, converts a blood into a semi-solid fil filler that also has growth factors in it. Um, if anybody's ever been injecting PRP itself, you can, you, you can attest to the benefits of it. <laughs> a little louder? Oh, okay, cool. Um, so what, what, what we're essentially doing is we're creating PRP in a time-released uh, gel that will, uh, that will disp disperse over uh, several months. And it's derived from the patient's blood, so there's no worry about allergic reaction. There's no worry about um, um, having, having anything happen to them that normally happens with other fillers. Um, there's no excessive swelling that ends up happening. Um, it can be used anywhere on the face and body. It's good for immunocompromised patients or people that say they may be allergic to filler or to hyaluronic acid fillers, although I've only had like two or three of those in the past uh, several years. But there's a lot of people that just don't want to look puffy. And this is a great option for uh, avoiding the hyaluronic acids or in addition to using the hyaluronic acids because they, they both do a, a little different thing. It's great for difficult areas to treat, um, such as under the eyes, and I think Lee's played with that a little bit. Yeah, um, I agree certainly with everything that, um, that Peter said, and 
you know, when you're mentioning using something that uh, is a little more integrative and doesn't have some of the problems that we've had with other fillers, um, for those of y'all that remember, and unfortunately I skipped out on collagen injections and so forth, but I spent a lot of time digging that out of patients and a lot of other fillers, including hydroxyapatite fillers and so forth. That, um, and I think when we all got HA products, um, which I still use, you know, it was kind of a, a kind of a relief because you had something that was much less reactive. Um, but still there were areas, um, I had a lot of colleagues who were some of the forefront people using HA fillers in the periorbital region. I never really was comfortable with it and liked it. And when this product came out, it was kind of like it is, the next step of going, Phew, okay, now I can really go anywhere with this product. And I do, I use it extensively around the eyes and all layers, and we'll get into that more. But it's, uh, I guess now I'm kind of at a point where I'm trying to decide where I can't use it, and I haven't found it anywhere yet, so. Yeah, that, I agree, that's what I found to be true too. Uh, works well in the tear troughs, works well in the lip lines, and the coolest thing is you got large volumes to play with. Um, the, the, you know, the problem with hyaluronic acid fillers or other choices out there, you know, CC is a fifth of a teaspoon. I mean, where, where are you going to go with that? So you, we can get up to 13 mLs of, of material to, to use on this. So what's the mechanism of action? So there's going to be a test on this in a little bit. Um, PRP, platelet-rich plasma, um, or plate, uh, and basically what we what we got in the platelets is not so much all these wonderful things that it does, but look look at all the receptors on there. It's got laminin, collagen, fibrinogen, um, von Willebrand's factor. Um, there's so many receptors on there, we, we still don't totally understand exactly what the platelet does, and much less the growth factors that go along with the platelets. But essentially what we're doing is we're simulating the wound cascade. And what that is, is you have a wound, you initially get hemostasis, you get inflammation to recruit cells to grow, um, then you go through recovery and remodeling. Now, the, the problem with some of the PRP systems that are on the market right now is the hemostasis and inflammation category. We really don't want that part. Uh, what we really want is the recovery and remodeling because that's, that's where uh, we get the, the greatest benefit of new growth of tissue. So it activates growth factors and the growth factors make all sorts of wonderful things happen that we want to have happen um, when we're injecting an anti-aging compound. So things to analyze, if you're trying to decide which PRP system to use, or you know, even if this is a good PRP system, we're, we're gonna go over why that's important. You know, the platelet concentration, obviously important. Red blood cell contamination, well, you know, when I was playing with PRP 20 years ago in my cosmetic surgery fellowship, it was always a little pink. So, you know, we didn't, we thought, oh, it's a red blood cell, it's going back in the body, it doesn't make a difference. But it does make a difference, and we'll talk about that. Um, leukocyte concentration, leukocytes will, uh, will affect what's happening, and you know, we want this to be creative, creating new tissue, and we want it to be user friendly. So look at a red blood cell. So what happens when, when a red blood cell uh, hemolysizes? That basically sends out a scream to the body that, hey, I've got a wound here, I need to fix it. Um, so what it initially does is sends a bunch of platelets towards the area, um, and, and that initiates the wound cascade of inflammation at, or hemostasis and, and inflammation. So we really don't want red blood cells to rupture. So whatever system we use has to keep the red blood cells intact and uh, keep them from, uh, from breaking. This is some of the other systems on the market as you can compare from um, opposite screens. Um, the PRP. Oh, okay, gotcha. Here. No. We're, no. we're not taking it away. We're yeah. <laughs> <laughs> other systems on the market, you can see that ours does not have any red, red blood cells in it. Um, so red blood cells give signals to cause inflammation. Um, and we know that in dermatology because basically we don't want crust to form on a wound. Um, if a crust forms on the wound, that provides inflammation, the wound doesn't heal quite so well. So we don't, we don't really want blood in our system. So the way this, the way these, this is the relative sizing of uh, white blood cells here. And the way the centrifuge works is it works on density uh, like heaviness of, of, of the individual cells and actually size of the individual cells. And that's kind of a relative volume configuration of what lymphocytes and monocytes and basal cells look. Um, so white blood cells, we don't want white blood cells either because what's the first thing that happens when you get an infection? 
you know, lymphocytes come into the, come into the area. Um, so that produces inflammation. We don't want inflammation. Uh, we want recovery and remodeling. Um, so we want to minimize how many white blood cells will actually be present in the, in the uh, system. And we got monocytes. So monocytes are, all right, hairy little ball there. And uh, monocytes are, are kind of like uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. So monocytes are circulating around the bloodstream, uh, trying to decide whether they're going to be good cop or bad cop. And if they see something that needs inflammation, then they'll become pro-inflammatory. If they see something that needs to have healing, then they'll become pro-healing. So there's certain types of monocytes you want. Uh, so monocytes will turn into a macrophage phage basically when, when they become activated. So we don't want the M1s, we want the M2s, because the M2s are anti-inflammatory, regenerative, uh, phagocytosis, angiogenesis, immunomodulation, all these good things that we want to have happen. Other systems out there, you know, I, I, what's interesting to me is I didn't do PRP, I did PRP, like I said, 20 years ago, and then I really wasn't that interested in it until Eric told us to uh, try, try this out. Um, so the way I'm explaining this to you is kind of the way I learned it over the last, last th uh, four months. Uh, there's Buffy coat system. So what the Buffy coat system is, is you spin it, and when you spin it, the red blood cells go to the bottom, and in between you have this little white layer that has white blood cells in it, platelets, and above it you have plasma. Um, and what we want is, is you want to get to the platelet layer. But the problem is you can't really get to the platelet layer because there's little red blood cells right underneath it. So ultimately you're going to get a little bit of contamination. And aside from getting a little bit of contamination, you also get other white blood cells in there. So you'll get, you'll get platelets, monocytes, lymphocytes, and neutrophils because they're all stuck in there on, the, uh, on that buffy coat area. Um, so the buffy coat isn't a physical separation. It's, it's a visual separation. Um, so what we really need is a physical separation. So what Salinas did is they came up with this gel that's of, it acts as a sieve. And what it does is it lets the red blood cells out. Um, so 100% of the red blood cells are captured at the bottom, um, which is pretty impressive. 95% uh, of the white blood cells are, 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 are sieved out. And then what's left is uh, plasma and, uh, pl uh, and, and platelets at the top. And uh, do you have, do you have a, one of the little guys? I do. Let's see. There we are. Yeah. So can, ever, can everybody see the separation gel in here? This is the small tube. It's, it's probably not very good. Here, do, you have the, do you have the bigger tube in there? Yeah, I'm a little uncomfortable with this, though. I'm not uh, sure what oh, there we go. Yeah, there, <laughs> there we go. Yes. So it comes, it comes in small and it comes in large. <laughs> so the cool part, 100% red blood cells on the bottom, the separation gel. You can see there's two different layers here. Uh, I, mean, I, you know, I couldn't spray paint two different colors. The yellow is kind of hard. But anyway, a more concentrated uh, area of platelets um, down below and above is an acellular area of, um, of, of albumin uh, and plasma. And it's very easy to get what you want out of this, um, and it's all because of the patented separator gel. Um, and that, that's, that's an important facet to why uh, Salinas does so well with this. So again, the filter's based on size and density, so if you, if you look at the, these cells here, that's a neutrophil with red blood cells, and those little dots are platelets. Um, so, what we're after is, 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 the, is the little dot guys and, and sieve out all of, the, uh, all of the larger molecules. Other systems will look more like the Buffy coat. See how you got the activated platelets? Um, if you ever Google what a platelet looks like, it sort of looks like a UFO, a little flying saucer. And then when you activate it, it looks like uh, the thing from Alien that jumped on someone's face. Um, so what it does is it just has tentacles to it and it just grabs and clots things. And that's pretty obvious in the Buffy code system, the way the platelets are all aggregated around, around the red blood cells. What you see with the derma PRP is you just got a whole bunch of platelets, um, got one billion platelets per microliter, uh, one million platelets per microliter, and then you've got some of the monocytes that are, uh, that are in there as well. And that's... Other cool thing about it is there's anticoagulants already in it. So if you've played with PRP before, you might have to add some calcium carbonate. You, have, you have to, might put in too much. You might have put in too little. You don't have to worry about that. This is already coated inside of the container. Um, 
the gel is already in there. Uh, the anticoagulant is set up at pH 7, so it's not going to burn when you, re when you re inject it. It's a closed system. You don't have to worry about bacteria um, contaminating it. Uh, the tubing size is such that uh, the speed that the red blood cells go into the tube is not going to be such that the red blood cells rupture and then cause an inflammatory reaction. And uh, the centrifuge is all pre set up with, with the, the number of revolutions that it needs to have. This is basically how we do it. Um, we harvest the blood. Uh, we put this little uh, venting tube in. And this is a cool little needle that actually has a, um, a, a gauze or something inside of it that, that doesn't allow uh, dust to get in. And the reason we, we, we put the venting tube in is we don't want the plasma to get, uh, to get disturbed because all the platelets have been centrifuged to the bottom. So after you've centrifuged it, you've got platelets at the bottom. You got platelet poor plasma at the top, platelet rich plasma at the bottom, and then we suck out the uh, platelet poor plasma, which is the more clear solution. Uh, place that into a syringe, um, and then we heat that up for, for uh, 10 minutes, and, uh, let it, and then we let it cool. Then uh, we resuspend the platelets. So after, after we've taken out the platelet poor plasma, heated it up, turned it into a gel. And the heating up is interesting uh, because you can change the consistency of it based on how much you heat it. Now, I would recommend that the first dozen times you do this, you just do this the standard 10 minutes. But Lee, what is your experience with the heating times? Yeah, so um, I kind of came across this serendipitously. When you, when you mix this according to the standard protocol, which is the way I do it now probably half the time, um, it's a, it's fairly thick and viscous, um, which is great, particularly starting out because you're probably going to use this kind of as a replacement in a way for a filler or use it in places that you would uh, use a filler that you're already comfortable with doing, right? Um, but this system, like Peter said, is so set up and easy when it comes. It's, you don't have to really change any of the buttons and so forth, but that's not my nature. So before I read the directions, I started kind of playing around with it. And the one of the first patients I did, thank goodness, was an employee and somebody who you know was willing to be kind of tried on. And um, I actually put the PPP, the platelet yes. poor plasma, in and turned the heating thing on. I had this little ten minute timer, and I thought, okay, well you go to, for ten minutes and then it's ready. Well. No, actually, you have to heat the machine up and it should stay at the high heat for 10 minutes. But what I got out was a less viscous, less thick platelet poor plasma uh, to mix back with the platelet rich plasma. I just had a much um, less viscous material, which opened my eyes to going to a lot of places with it that I would not typically use something thicker, for instance, very, very superficially in the eyelids when people have little crepe paper wrinkles. Same thing with intradermal injections in the face. So um, turns out that, um, you know, Anne had already on, in her way been, been doing something, because like you said, the four of us were just kind of figuring this out. And um, I think Anne was, y'all were very in uh, times of heating, length of times of heating, if I'm not mistaken and getting different viscosities with that, which I've also been doing that some. Um, but yeah, that's one of the many things that I like about this is you can vary the viscosity and realize what you're changing the viscosity of is your platelet poor plasma with the albumin, right? So it really doesn't change what this product is doing or all the benefits other than maybe, and I say maybe, I don't think we really know yet, how long it's going to persist kind of in a filled state. Mm -hmm. But where you're using the thinner, that's not really your concern, if that makes sense, too. I'm not trying to, you know, mm -hmm. fill volume with it. If I'm trying to fill volume, I'm doing that with something that's thicker. Um, but, yeah, the system is just so easy and so self-explanatory. And if you've ever used PRP in the past, and, you know, like he said, I've been doing PRP since the late 90s, early 2000s with multiple different systems. And this one clearly, well, it's more clear. The, PR, the PRP is much more clear. And you don't have as much of the inflammatory um, cell mediators in there. And uh, 
I think it's a real game changer, you know. And, and look, I'm probably like y'all are. When they first came to me, it's another PRP system. I'm like, oh, great, another PRP system. I've watched these come and go for 20 years. And uh, I thought, okay, well, we'll take a look at it. And the first time that I was able to see it live, you know, it was clearly I was looking at things that I had not seen before. So it's a really, it's a different type of PRP system, at least in my hands. Um, and it's hard for me to screw it up. <laughs> um, uh, and then uh, going through the steps, we take the cool PRP, like, uh, like Lee said, mix it back and forth, and then we have our, our Salinas Derma. We have a video that kind of shows this quickly if we can press play. I press play? I think so. It's on Saloma. There's also a little vented disc on here. Um, the vented disc stops you from having any particulates that may be undesirable. Um, perhaps if the, if the rubber from the tube gets into it or if the separator gel comes apart, so that, that's what the disc is for, an added level of safety. And you got 10 cc's to play with. So I did large surface areas, I mostly did uh, hands and, and preauricular and, and necks. Um, and then I got a little more aggressive after I, I was uh, excited about the results of that. So the way, the way this works is the platelet pore plasma, PPP, which is the top, is composed mostly of albumin. And albumin is a, is a fairly simple protein, and when you denature it, what happens is the ends become sticky. And when it be, the ends become sticky, they kind of combine together, um, and they form this other mesh network. So it's very similar to the way they do you know, the hand holding with hyaluronic acid with BDDE. Um, but, you know, we're, what we're doing is making a, a mesh network made out of your own body. So it's autologous, uh, it decomposes uh, w within your body over a, over a certain time period. And that time period is based on how thick you made it, how much quantity you injected, and how often you injected it. And this is what it looks like on an electron microscopic uh, basis. Uh, so basically there's little caverns and clouds and, and a bunch of little platelets are, are basically time released inside of that gel. Um, so it got, it's got all the benefits of PRP, but it also time releases uh, the PRP over, over a future time period. And I kind of look at this like, uh, you know, you may see an apple tree there, but you know, what I see is a bunch of juicy platelets that are just ready to come to the surface and be plucked and placed inside of your dermis to thicken your dermis and make your skin more luminescent. Lots of clinical evidence. Uh, if you're going to read any studies at all, this, this guy did a, this woman did a very good job of, uh, of studying this in, in Russia. And she compared it, compared it to PRF, uh, platelet-rich fibrin, which is commonly used out there. And all she did is she put it into a, a Petri dish, and she left it there for 24 hours and watched what happened to the fibrin clot. It essentially just shrunk into nothingness over 20, 24 hours. Uh, basically, 23% of it remained. Uh, when compared with the clot, not the clot, the autologist uh, gel uh, PRG that we're using here, that stayed 96%. So it, it didn't degrade at all over a 24-hour period. They actually went so far as to leave it in a test tube and let it sit for a year, and at the end of the year, it looked the same. So, uh, so the stuff persists, certainly uh, in vitro. In vivo, it, it, it decomposes over time, which is kind of what we want. G primes are, are, are pretty large, they're in the, in the thousand, um, whereas, uh, you know, so that's a good comparison to, uh, to hyaluronic acid. Um, and you know, of, all, of all these studies you read, it, it, the interesting thing is, you know, you, there's patient satisfaction and there's physician in, um, satisfaction. All, all the patient satisfactions are, are positive. Um, so that, that's, that's, maybe it's easy to please people in Russia, I'm not sure, but it's, uh, it, it, it's interesting to me how all the patients were happy with their treatments. Yeah, and I would add in, this to me is one of the more important things about it. I've been using a system I had been using for years, both for hair and other areas of a platelet-rich fibrin matrix. In this clumping, you know, that's shown on this slide, I was seeing that clinically. And um, 
you, you know that if that's going on physically, I don't think you're getting probably the release of the platelet growth factors and so forth over time like you should also. Um, so not only is it something that, you know, for what we're using it for structurally and anatomically, it's a game changer, but also because you're getting that prolonged release over time um, and, and, you know, staying like you put it. So this is, this was a pretty big deal to me. Yeah, it, it is a game changer. P PRF is kind of like the original collagen that lasted two weeks, but the, you know, they said it lasted three months. Yeah. And then, you know, this is like a, like a hyaluronic acid that, that you know, persists forever on, yeah. on someone's right. opinions. What I liked about this study is, is he, they, they, they studied other things other than longevity of filler. Uh, so when I mean this is a new category of filler, I mean it does something a little different than what we expect filler to do. When you inject hyaluronic acid, it, you, get a pu you get a puffiness. Um, this injected as a volumizer actually changes the skin. In, in that Fedoika study, they, they, they noted that there was a 20% increase in dermal thickness. And the dermal thickness is increased greater in older people than it did in younger people, um, which is great because all the baby boomers would like their skin to in increase more. But what definitely happened is they had, they had a, a, a greater trans epidermal water loss, so there's more hydration to the skin. And there, there's an almost imperceptible, almost a photographically imperceptible uh, luminescence to the skin. Uh, the pigmentation gets better, the, the healthiness of the skin gets better. Uh, I, I haven't combined this yet with my scarlet, um, and just because of logistics, um, but uh, I, I, it, it's gonna be a really great thing uh, when, when you notice what happens to these people's skin after a period of time. Have you noticed it? Uh, I have, and actually, so um, I'm sure like a lot of you all have in your practice, some of these patients who <coughs> really have the very, very lax skin Again, that r real severe crepe papery skin with very, very superficial rhydids. Something that, um, you know, you could try all day with volume to fill and unless you blow them up like a tight balloon, you know, they're still gonna be there. And y'all know the kind of patients that I'm talking about and they're very difficult, you know. Um, outside of some, you know, really aggressive procedures that are uncomfortable for the patient and for the practitioner to put someone through. Um, you don't have a real good treatment. So um, one particular patient who's been a patient for a long time, um, I asked her to come in early on and I've just done her second injection and I'm going to actually continue to do her about, uh, I think every three months or so is what I've got her on the schedule of. So after her first three month follow up, you know, the thing that was really most noticeable was the quality of the skin and the loss of a lot of those little superficial crepe paper rhydids. Um, and I'm doing it without changing her volume much. Now, at some point she may need some volume, that's fine, I'll take my thicker you know, um, product and go deeper. But uh, I'm, I'm really noticing that. And that to me is you know, what makes so much sense about this. We all know the benefits of what PRP does. It's just that they're very short last and short acting and you know, they're not a facelift and they're not, um, uh, I don't know, you know, they're, they're a short acting uh, product that has some real benefit. Um, and this is taking that and crossing over, I like the term volumizer, but going towards that filler function, but you're really getting this physiologic change, which to me is what I'm as excited about as anything, because if you, you know, if you really do change and rejuvenate the quality of the skin, Right, that's the root thing that we're all after, you know, and being able to say that is, is pretty neat. And I'm, I'm definitely seeing it in practice. Um, I think it was just last week or the week before I did her second injection. So stay tuned by spring. Um, I think we'll have some really good photos on her and others. Excellent for scarring, um, as you would think, because PRP is just good for, for scarring. They, they, they used it on uh, acne scarring and um, you know, 100% of the patients got, got decent results. Um, as you look at the, what the thickness is, this is how it, how it comes out. Um, almost comes out like the, the thickness of radius um, or a really fine um, fat transfer. And 
this is the acne scars we were talking about. So they, what they did is they treated it intradermally, um, they treated it topically, um, and uh, everybody showed benefits, but the people that showed the most benefits were the ones they injected intradermally. Well, they also used a dermal roller on it too. Um, but that, that's pretty, pretty good right there for the, for the results they're getting on acne scars, which is kind of a, a difficult uh, result to get. So here's Drusella. She's 85, and I don't really like doing stuff to her because she's 85, and, and, um, but she's got a birthday coming up. Um, so she comes in for, for, her, for her birthday, and you can see over on the right side, someone tried to put some hyaluronic acid in on her, on her pre-auricular, and, and it kind of got a little clumpy there. Um, so what I did with her is I, I, uh, I, I, I did 13 mLs um, you know, in everywhere, basically, pre-auricular, pre um, intradermal around her lips. Um, didn't do in her lips, nasolabial folds. Um, and you know she didn't get a she didn't get a fantastic before and after, but you can certainly say that she certainly looks better at two months than she did before. Um, and you can look at the way her skin is, is glowing a little bit more at two months than it did than it did before. Um, and they're pretty similar. I have a photographic room, so I try to make all the lighting the same, and I try to take all the pictures the same. Um, but uh, uh, definitely a photographical difference, and she's, she's happier. And, and the, the wonderful thing about injecting this is, is the downtime is minimal. I mean, right, the day of treatment, you, people are a little swollen because you're injecting large volumes. Um, but the next day or two, it's, it's significantly down. I'm so impressed with how fast it heals. Yeah, absolutely. And um, y'all probably hear me kind of sound apologetic some. I'm not a salesperson type at all. It's not my nature. So. Um, and as I think sometimes we're so enthusiastic about this, it sounds like, you know, this is some kind of rehearsed sales thing. I had no idea what you were going to talk about, and, you know, <laughs> I'm just up here to, I don't know, kind of add some fluff. But, um, you know, when this product first came out, and it's like, you know, 12, 13 cc's, I'm like, well, geez, what the hell am I going to do with 12 or 13 cc's? Now, I'm like, I could even use two of these um, because of exactly what you just said, how quickly they heal. The swelling goes down back to kind of the volume that you injected. And it's amazing that most people that you're going to see can handle that much volume. You may initially think like I did, where am I going to put all of this? Right. But um, you know, what we were doing with fillers is really picking out you know, one furrow or just one area of depression and concentrating on that. With this, you can really sculpt and contour the whole face. And uh, the other thing that I noticed on the acne scars is kind of similar to what I was doing with the lady, or now a few of them um, with the multiple superficial rhytids, is going intradermally with a sharp needle, which I'm sure we'll show this afternoon, and then right subdermal, which in my mind is kind of giving that dermis maybe more of its rejuvenation as well. Um, the cool part of that is you don't have to think, oh, well, I need to use, depending on what products you use, pick your line, you know, if you're with Allergan, I need to use Volbella for this, and I need to use Velour for this, and I need to use Voluma for this. It, it, this is what you use, and so it's, it, you don't really have to think about that. You really can put it in any of these places, and, um, you know, in the superficial things like acne scars or the superficial rhytids, I'm even overfilling those where they have, you know, a little visible cord initially, and uh, within two days that's gone, or a day that's gone. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, the volume of it is great. Yeah, and, and I think you need to overfill a little bit compared to what you're using with, yeah. with how you're on. Yeah, yeah, it's probably, probably one and a half times. So I was very conserv I was very conservative with with some of these. Uh, most of my pictures, I was conservative with with the injections. But the, gr the great thing about this is it's good for beginning injectors because it's so forgiving, and it's good for advanced injectors because it handles areas that cost a lot of money to do. I mean, to, to, to put filler in this part of the face or in the neck or in the back of the hands uh, requires a lot of, a lot of uh, tubes. So this is, this is Kendra, and, uh, and uh, this, she was my first one, so I didn't know exactly how much filling it would do, and you know, you, you kind of pick your patients who are your friends to, to try things on as gifts, and you, you, you know, you don't want to overdo them. Um, and she looked really great immediately, immediately afterwards. 
Um, but that's essentially the areas I did with the uh, 22 gauge cannula um, from, from one port. Um, and that shows how much swelling she had from, from, having, from having that treatment. Um, <clears throat> and then that shows her two months after. And again, skin, skin looks more epiluminescent. Now I also did uh, her, her neck. Uh, so her cheeks were the second thing I did. So the first month I did her neck, I put 13 cc's in her neck, uh, you know, six on each side. Um, and I was, uh, I was a little worried because it, it, it was kind of bulky, but I, we basically massaged it and, it, and it and it went down within five days, so that, that was good. Um, and then I, I brought her back and I did her preauricular. So um, this is two months after, after 60 C's in her preauricular area, but her neck is, is three months out. Um, so increasing the, the, the luminescence of the neck and, and the trans epidermal water loss is, is uh, or decrease in the trans epidermal water loss is, is, is it's, look, it's looking pretty good. And again, three months after, so um, that's three months on the neck and two, two months on the cheeks. This is uh, one of my uh, MAs that went on to become a nurse th uh, that is now a nurse injector. Um, so I, I, I basically spread around 13 cc's on her all over her, her face. And um, this was the, the first pair of lips that I did. And, and the interesting thing about lips is you increase the color of the lips. So this is the only product I've ever seen that actually makes your lips redder. Um, and in, in a pleasant way, right? It doesn't look like you just smacked them in the face or anything. <laughs> they, they just they, they have more color to their lips. Have you noticed that? I have, yeah. And um, yeah, go ahead. I, I'll have more to say, I'm sure. <laughs> so again, it. immediately after, so she was, uh, she, she didn't want her husband to know that she did something that night, but um, we didn't get away with that. Um, but again, not much swelling, really, if we're putting 13 cc's in the face. And again, that's, that's it, or 12 cc's in the face. Um, and then three weeks post, yeah, so hopefully everybody can see that. Uh, yeah, and this is what I noticed. I love looking at this picture on the top right and the one below, because top right is immediately following in there right. at three months. Three, three then, weeks. Yeah, um, and then if you go and look back at the original, you know, it just, one, it looks healthier to me overall. The, um, I've definitely noticed the coloration, and you know, I'm using this also to treat superficial rhytids and then lip volume at the same time, and you know, kind of outline the white roll as well. But um, yeah, this is you know, this is what I like, what I'm seeing. Yeah. So I initially started using it transdermal or underneath the underneath the dermis, basically, is what I was going for. I wasn't using it as a as a deep filler on on the periosteum, although I have done that a, a couple of times. I've, Rob, Rob's my first client that we did when we first practiced and his is periosteal on his cheekbones and he's still incredibly handsome. Um, so it, it works. Uh, so after talking to Lee, I did, I, I did uh, this one because he was injecting it intradermally and subdermally and around the eyes and in the lips and I'm going, man, I'm only doing preauricular necks. So um, I, I went a little crazy on, on her. Um, and I, I basically injected it in, intradermally. And, and the interesting thing is if you, if you stick like a hyaluronic acid intradermally and tried to chase each individual line, I mean, you, you, you'll get a lot of trauma that happens through that. Um, but this particular product doesn't, doesn't really, it gives you a little bit of swelling, but it pretty much just gets into all the crevices and doesn't, uh, doesn't cause a significant amount of trauma. Uh, now, that's not a standardized photograph on the right, because unfortunately, I, I tried to bring her in yesterday and she's out of town for the week, so I told her to snap a picture for me. And I did, I did her cheeks periosteally, so that's why she's got a little bit of swelling there on, the, on her left. Um, but she's been, a, she's been a little bit of a, a challenge uh, around the mouth. She's had, a, she's had scarlets and she's had uh, Agnes's and, and, and I think the combination of that with, with the PRP is, is really gonna help us with the the wrinkles around the mouth. Um, my feeling is those wrinkles around the mouth are caused from uh, dental x-rays. I can't, can't get anybody to agree with me on that, but there's a certain spectrum of people who have really nice teeth, and if you look at them, their skin is beautiful, except for right around their mouth. And that, that doesn't make sense for me from a dermatological point of view, because you know, the sunlight comes down and their whole face should be wrinkled like that. But you know, they've got wrinkles upon wrinkles uh, and total loss of collagen periorally. Um, so that's, that's an aside. So I'm going to stop right here because this one catches my eye. And this is the first time for me seeing this too, y'all. 
So, you know, when you look at, and I'm a real um, sensitive to kind of volume in the face, and, um, you know, with fillers, I've said this a lot before, um, as we age, I'm a good example of it, you know, as the face kind of tends to descend, you get more volume here, right? And you get more volume here. So your volume is shifting downward and centrally on the face. And so people come in and they're complaining maybe of, you know, marionette lines and, and nasolabial folds. Um, and so what do we do? We grab some filler off the shelf and we inject it. And what we're doing a lot of times is we're putting more volume in a part of the face that the problem that they're coming to us for is more volume, right? And so you make somebody really look kind of big and full around the face. Um, and it's one of my pet peeves. And previously, you know, surgery was one of the ways that we can restore that volume and move it back to where it was. But that requires surgery and a lot of healing and more risk and downtime. And that's not what people want these days so much. But to me, when you look at this picture on the far left, and I realize this is just a picture she snapped, but you look at the volume in her face and look at her eyes, you know, after he's injected the cheeks deep. And, you know, you didn't do anything to her eyes, right? Mm -mm. Just look at her whole periorbital area. This is this whole thing that we've been preaching for years, surgically and non-surgically, of this, you know, lid-cheek junction and, uh, you know, a good blending of the lid and the cheek that gives you that youthful, more almond-shaped eye and less rounded-out kind of cadaveric eye of aging, right? I mean, you know, that was one of the first things I noticed is looking at the picture on the left and the right were her eyes. And I'm like, I don't think he did anything to her eyes. But, you know, again, this is restoring that volume back. And with that single product, this is where the 13 cc's come in and where I'm all going, <laughs> he's going now. Yeah, give me more. I want more. I, I only got 12. Darn. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. But, um, you know, that to me, that and the natural look of that, I can't get that with a filler. Um, any number of fillers. And then, not to mention, just around the periorrhytids, this is exactly what I'm kind of noticing on my patients. Look, these things on the left are very, as you all know, they're very hard to treat, um, unless you're gonna be super aggressive. Um, and, you know, if I can, over six months, nine months, a year's time, make a, pick your number, 50 probably is, is we're gonna have a much better results than that. but. 75% improvement in that, that's an absolute game changer, you know, in something that they drive themselves up to the office, have done, drive home, and the next day go about their business. So, yeah, that's a really cool set of pictures there. Yeah, okay. there you go. There we go. Uh, hands? Uh, I, I, so, I don't know how many people are doing hands. I. You know, I, I do hands when, you know, you got a few patients that are addicted to you, right? And they come in like every six months or, and eventually they have enough. So you can't really put more in their face. And then you go, okay, well, <laughs> how about your hands? Um, but, you know, for me, the, it, it, you know, I used to use uh, radius, but uh, the problem with radius is not reversible. I had one person that had like grip problems afterwards, so I couldn't, I couldn't reverse it. So I stopped using permanent fillers in the back of the hands. Then I switched to hyaluronics, and the problem with hyaluronics is you know, I mean, you could put five cc's in each hand. So now, you know, almost all my patients who, who are appropriately filled in the face now are, you know, are getting their neck and their hands done um, because it's, it's easy to do. And uh, even when you did the hyaluronics in the back of the hands, the, you know, the longevity of that isn't that significant. I mean, people get it done, but, you know, they're not coming back every six months to do it. They're not coming back every year to do it. You know, they kind of did it and said, oh, I'm sort of disappointed with it. I'm not going to really do it again. Um, but with this increasing the, uh, the way the skin looks on the back of the hands and actually making the skin look better on the back of the hands is, uh, I, I think, a, a whole new different type of volumizer. So we're, 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 the, the cell isn't so much to make it a volumizer like a filler. It's more of a, uh, we're, we're changing the way your skin is. We're making your skin younger. We're doing integrative aesthetics here where we're actually uh, trying to get your body to produce more collagen in the areas that, that you have lost it in. Yeah, it was restorative. I mean, that's the kind of the way I put it. It's, yeah. I think we're moving to that in hopefully all areas of medicine. Yeah, and she's so happy she's wearing more bracelets, so it's uh, working out. <laughs> uh, but anyway, four and a half cc's on each, on each hand. Um, I mean, that, that, you know, I, I think I put the other, you know, probably in her pre-auricular area. 
So there's, you know, there's, there's, there's the small one, which is, what, six MLs? You I never know, used it, right? I don't know. I, I lose I, the large one because yeah. you want to get 12 out of it, right? <laughs> um, so, I mean, once you start using this, you'll, you, you'll almost always use the large one. Yeah, um, seven or something. It's a, what is it, guys, seven? I have several of them, and I thought that's all I'd be using, but they're sitting way up on the shelf, and I'm using mainly the large ones. I do use the small ones if I'm just doing either lips or periorbital, right. but right. Uh, it's rare the patient that for the small amount extra, and I you know, can't find something to do with the, the rest on a larger. And this is also good for the patient. You know, again, people come in with lips, uh, you know, or that need lips, right? And, and generally anybody over 50 is extremely fearful about doing their lips because, you know, there's ones that really want to do it and those people, <coughs> but really 80% of them are afraid to do their lips, but they really need to. Um, this is a great product to use for them and, and you can, you know, it doesn't have the puffiness that the, uh, an HA has. Um, and it, it induces color in their lips, which is something you lose as you get older as well. Uh, here, here's a, uh, a, 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 this was an account that, wanted, that was, um, just, just came on board with, uh, with uh, PRP Derma, and uh, they didn't want to buy it until they actually saw it demonstrated and used, and so they brought their, uh, they brought their, person in charge of their Instagram in to get something done. Um, so I didn't get any post-ops on her because they, they live a while away, but I had her send me a picture of it the next day. Um, and um, she's just totally thrilled. Um, so it's really great for patient, for filler naive people, um, because again, their fear is to be, puff, is there be they're gonna be puffy. And that's, again, 96% of the population's fear. You know, we're only taking care of 4% of the population with, 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 with HA fillers. Um, I know it doesn't seem like that, but you know, that, that's who we're taking care of. So there's 96% of the population that is waiting for us to do better, and this is a way for us to do better um, without making people look odd. Um, here we are with the uh, next again. Um, so again, notice that the texture of the skin looks better. Um, so I didn't inject as much, because after, uh, you know, after putting the nine cc's in, um, and I, I put in too much in the other, in the other uh, lady, so I went a little bit less on, on this one. Um, and I think I put the rest of it in the, in the back of her hands or something. But her skin, her, her neck looks better. Uh, around the eyes, um, I haven't ventured there yet, but I, I know you have, Lee. Yeah, I, you know, um, I do a lot of oculoplastic surgery still. Um, I use Agnes very aggressively around the eyes and uh, I was, for many years, over 20 years, I've been using autologous fat of all different consistencies, and, uh, and I still use fat, and I still like it. Um, the difference is, you know, it's more cumbersome to harvest. Instead of just drawing somebody's blood, I've got to, you know, harvest the fat. It's a little bit more cumbersome to process. I actually am using fat along with this product as well. I don't know if I've told the company that yet, but I'm, I will talk now. <laughs> it's, it's going fine. Um, and... Um, but uh, around the eyes, this is wonderful, you know, and again, it's this volume thing, you know, when you look at bags under the eyes, you've got to really determine, are the bags too big, are they puffy, or are they just really sunken in, you know, along the tear trough and that lid cheek junction and the upper cheek volume loss, because there's a number that you might just take out Agnes to, you know, use that you're, you're taking too much volume away and then you're giving them that sunken cadaveric eye and what they need is some fill. Um, and, and I have a lot of patients who I'm doing a combination of, of both, where I'm doing Agnes on the lower eyelids, uh, fat bags, and then Salinas Derma into the, the fold there, into the trough. Um, and, you know, again, um, I don't like HA fillers around the eye. It's just my personal feeling. I know there are people out there that do okay with them. Um, I tend to see... Um, let me say, I've never injected there. And although I've had my share of problems and complications with anything that we use, uh, I don't inject filler around the eyes, but I've taken care of a lot of problems with filler around the eyes, and they're a booger to take care of, really. But this product being autologous and the way that it really kind of, um, you know, incorporates, I guess is the right word, over time, is just a very, very comfortable product to use around the eyes. And, uh, 
and like I said, I use it from very superficial to uh, a bit deeper um, to fill in. And um, yeah, I, it's, it, you know, it's really kind of common sense once you see the product today why, why it would be very useful there. Um, yeah, I love it. Needle or cannula? Uh, so I'm primarily using a 25 gauge cannula for the majority of what I'm doing. Particularly, that's what I would be using on this patient for volume. Um, when I'm really trying to fill in that trough. Um, I use the, a 25 and a 27 gauge sharp needle for intradermal, but one, you have to have it thinner. You're not gonna use the usual 10 minute heating time and get it through that 27 very easily. I think when we were in Phoenix, we did that a little bit. Maybe Dave, we were able to get some through with the 27, but a lot of it clumps up. Um, and, um, but, but mostly in the lids, the, I'm using a cannula and maybe just going in literally immediately right under the dermis and filling some volume and all the way up to the lash line. Clearly all the way literally to the lash line. Wow. Yeah. I make two little stab holes, you know, one kind of in the trough down here and one kind of just outside of the lateral canthus. And with that, I'm taking that cannula and running it right down underneath the lash line and just laying it back. Same with coming from this way. So, yeah, I love it for that. Thank you. All right, that was great. I take my bag, yeah. Thank you. Put that big one back there. Do you oh, want to take questions, questions or uh, are we gonna? Sure, we're here. Who's got a question? With bruising? Are you, are you talking about volume or bruising? I didn't miss. Bruising. Yeah. How does it compare to other fillers and other injectables with bruising? But much less, from my point of view. Yeah. yeah. So, um, with. Um, for me, around the, uh, let me just talk about specific areas. Around the eyes, um, I get more bruise from where I usually take, you know, anywhere from an 18 to a 25 gauge just to make my little stab hole to get my cannula in. I have more bruising from that where I make my entry site yeah. than I do from injecting the product. Right. So, you know, the, the product itself. But, you know, you're using a blunt cannula, and I would say, you know, even when I'm using fat, whatever I'm using with a blunt cannula, I'm not usually getting a lot of bruising. Certainly not with this, but you know, one thing, common sense, you're putting a bunch of platelets in there too. So right. um, if you do, it probably handles that a little better than an HA filler does, I guess. Right. Um, it's certainly not more bruising, and I would like to say less bruising. Although, you know, I don't see a ton um, I mean, we all get some, some bruising. Anytime you, sh you stick a needle, you can get it. But you don't see a ton with filler, you know, going deeper really either. So, you know, neither one has a lot. But, um, yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not anything that will kind of pop up or you'll really think about that uh, one way or the other. So bruising, you know, that happens a lot more when you're first starting because you're so concentrating on technique and what I'm putting here or what I'm putting there. Remember, we're medical, right? So airway, breathing, circulation. Look at the patient. Are they holding their breath? <gasps> what do you think their blood pressure's doing? Yeah. Right? So all the blood is going into the neck, which is going into the face, which is going into the needle and coming out the hole. Um, so <laughs> I, I, I tell all my patients, relax your shoulders. I've been doing it for 10 years. Relax your shoulders, relax your shoulders. They didn't listen to me until I actually put it on a sign right in front of them. I numb them up and it says, relax shoulders, reduce bruising. And Every single patient, I can, I can, I, I, I'll, I'll start to do something, I can see they're doing this, and then they remember what they read. You know, so if you want to reduce bruising, try to, try to get the patient to relax a little bit, a little bit more. Um, and then know your anatomy, you know, stay away from high vascular areas that, that like to bruise more. Mm -hmm. Sure. Be gentle. Yes, sir. So fear of occlusion. Uh, well, luckily there has been no occlusions to date. But you know, it, it, to put out anything that's a volumizer or anything that has a viscosity greater than water and say that there's never going to be an occlusion is, isn't going to happen. So again, it, it, you know, know your anatomy. It, it, you use appropriate size cannulas. Stay stay away from vessels. 
um, know where the vessels are at. Um, yeah, so, you know, <laughs> look, that's the big scary thing. And, um, you know, um, I need some wood to knock on. I've not seen that with any of the products yet, but I'm, I'm a real chicken and scared of, uh, of occlusion. So um, when there's any concern, you, one, you've got to know your anatomy, you know, and you've got to know where the superficial vessels of the face are. And uh, it's not hard to brush up on, but, you know, that's, that's the first thing. You know, deeper injections around this area with a sharp needle, you know, you're taking your chance. Um, you can do it with a sharp needle safely. You just need to know where you are and where you're going. I think the other most important thing is whether you're one of those that tends to inject on insertion or withdrawal, um, the needle in my book, with, with some rare exceptions, say you're injecting intradermally for acne, the, the needle or the cannula needs to be moving if the syringe plunger is going. It, it, it needs to be moving. So, for instance, when I'm doing the eyes, and I don't say this um, carelessly because I'm a real chicken with all this, and you know, I'm one of the guys that gets called to deal with it when people have some of these problems, and you know, it's terrible to have to deal with them. But um, you know, when I'm inserting that blunt cannula, I'm going as far as I'm going to go with it, either to the hub or as far as I need to go and then I'm injecting on a smooth withdrawal. And if for some reason, you know, my plunger doesn't go smoothly, I'm not like stopping and trying to get it to go there. I'm backing it out and I'll come back again a second time. So just be patient, keep that moving. Um, but you know, operating around the eyelids all the time, I think with a blunt cannula, and I think eyes is where that's kind of the most concern, all that should be around the lips as well, but um, you know, have to, maybe have a little more effort to get those occluded. Um, but, uh, you know, as long as you are keeping that needle moving pretty rapidly as you go back, I don't, I'm not, I don't have a lot of fear of occlusion with that. But, um, but you know, if you kind of get caught in the moment and you're, you know, hard to inject and all of a sudden you, you get kind of an aliquot that's pushed, if you happen to be in the vessel, you know, it's probably going to occlude. Um, you know, uh, what would you do if you had an occlusion? Um, you know, because well, even if you like get an ocular occlusion, base, I mean, you can go you through know, the protocol, but you, you protocols go through the are not protocol, successful. and and really, you know, probably even more kind of stroke-like protocol with a blood thing like this. But yeah. I just don't, um, I don't see it as much of an issue based on the type of product we're using compared to like a thicker gel HA. You know, but uh, but still, you know, it's something you always have to. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah, I don't know. And, you know, probably how hyaluronidase wouldn't be. I, you know, I would probably right now use that same protocol because, you yeah. know, you've still got hyaluronic acid active with this product, too. It's just natural hyaluronic acid that's, you know, involved there. It's everywhere. You can't get away from it in the body. So. Uh, I wanted to know what was the protocol? Because you said you can just go to the protocol. So um, I will pull it up while we're here. But um, God, I can't remember the guy's name. In the Are you the protocol for ocular occlusion? Yeah. Is that is that your, what you're worried about? Or just occlusion in general? Or if Selenus had like an occlusion protocol, or however, whatever you guys have. Yeah. So I'll look that up while we're here and bring it out. There was a wonderful paper written on it. Um, I can't remember the guy in the Midwest who really f first started warning us about occlusions, and for some right. reason he was seeing a number. I don't know what was happening around the area that he was in, but it's a protocol that involves hyaluronidase. In some cases, you know, if the patient has to go or needs to go to the hospital, which they often do, they're using TXA yeah. um, and you know, clot busters and so forth. But it's a protocol depending on where the occlusion is and what the occlusion is doing. If it's I never Thank you, Sheriff. Hey there. I've heard some uh, I've heard some chatter about using heparin like you would Hylinex. What are your thoughts on that? You mean in, as in case of for a occlusion? Mm -hmm. Heparin is definitely part of the protocol. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Anybody else? Going once, going twice. Can we have a round of applause for our speakers, please? Thank you very much.
All right. Thank you, gentlemen. Great job. Thank you. All right. The next portion we have for you, um, we're going to bring our patient up and do uh, some live treatments uh, in multiple parts uh, of the anatomy on the face, neck, and hands, I believe. Um, so I would like to introduce a couple more colleagues of ours, uh, Miss Melissa Gibbons and Dr. Ann Watwood. You can give a round of applause for them as they come up, please. Um, Missy, as uh, we lovingly call her, has uh, been in the industry for quite some time, been an injector for, I believe, about the last 22 years, um, as well as Dr. Ann Watwood, uh, local here from Phoenix, as everybody knows if you've been through advanced training with us. Um, also an incredibly experienced uh, injector for the last couple of decades as well. Um, trust my face to her. So um, we thank you for your guys' input, and I will let them take the show. Thank you. Okay, so when they told me we were using the 11 ml tubes, I immediately said, why? Because in our practice, we went from the same thought process of what are we going to do with 22 to 11 is not enough. So we did the 22 cc syringe. We kind of made the executive decision, which ended up yielding about 12 cc's of, of goodness. And so um, we're going to be doing multiple areas of her face. Our patient, would you come, go ahead and come on up? We're going to just draw her off. She is numb. We topically numbed her. We also did a little bit of lidocaine with epinephrine at the ports or the sites that we are going to be injecting her. And we are going to do temples, cheeks, perioral uh, rhytids, a little bit in the marionette lines. And we'll just see if we have any left. Uh, she would also like a little bit in her lips as well. <laughs> we um, are going to be challenged with a 30-gauge um, needle, but I think I've been using a 30 gauge for the vertical rides and, and it doesn't seem to clot as quickly as I thought it would, but we're going to do that area first because I think the longer that it sits, sometimes we kind of have to remix it a little bit. And especially if you've used a PRF Easy Gel, we get, I tend to get a lot of clots with that and so I was really hesitant to think, am I going to get the same amount of clots with uh, derma, but you don't really seem to get as many clots because it seems like it's a more homogeneous mixture for whatever reason. I don't know if anyone else can speak to that as well, but the consistency does seem to be just a little bit smoother, if you will, um, and so I, 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 I feel like I don't have to worry about that as much. So I'm going to have you go ahead and actually I'm going to draw you, well, for camera, let's just have you kind of wipe back. While she's laying down and doing that, um, I just want to make a quick announcement. If you are number one through six patients, Please make your way back to the stations. We're going to go ahead and get your blood drawn and put some topical numbing on you. So one through six, go ahead and make your way back to each station. They start over here um, from the back forward, one, two, three, four, five, six. So go ahead and if you have those numbers when you're identified on the way in, go ahead and go back to the stations. Thank you. Um, do you care? Can you see her face? If not, I want to sit her up and kind of. Oh, okay. So, I mean, obviously when we're doing an assessment on a patient, we have them sitting up. And so the initial assessment was, hi, um, having her sit up. So, um, and just for Hollywood purposes, I do want to go ahead and do her rideds first because I don't want the product to become too thick to kind of do the, the rideds here. So I'm going to chase those kind of subdermally, um, just like Dr. Um, Thornton said, that he kind of does that intradermal, almost like can't be too superficial, even if it kind of seems like it's coming out of the pores. That's kind of the depth that you really don't care that you are and you really want to be because it will do two things. It will get rid of the rided, but it also helps build that skin integrity over time. So it's just kind of like casting a net in that area to recruit new collagen um, and vascularity, so to speak. So. There's gauze on that table right there. So while we're getting gauze, um, I'll go ahead and kind of draw out the other areas of her face that we're going to be treating as well. She has a little bit of, of temporal wasting. And I think, I don't know, you know, it's due to the aging process, but I also think people have just overdone their cheeks for so long. We kind of created that problem in the, temp in the temple. So we're going to add a little bit of volume in the temples here. I'm not going to go to bone. I am gonna not, I'm not going to do that technique. I'm going to be more in the skin there. Um, and so I'm going to treat her there just a tiny bit. And then she does not like kind of the under eye area here. 
So I'm going to go ahead and treat this as well. And I'm just, I'm going to remove these before I actually do the treatment because they kind of tend to get in my way. And then I'm going to do the pre-gel sulcus and just kind of, anytime you're treating around the mouth, I feel like you don't just treat one area, but you kind of have to globally fan in that entire region. So we're going to kind of fan from the lip all the way down to the chin because it gives a really nice projection and brings that tissue forward and gives it some support because as we age, because of the bone resorption, we start to collapse and close up. And so especially if someone comes into our practice and they want their lips done, we very rarely just treat their lips because if so, from um, a, a side profile view, they just don't look good. It, it doesn't look natural. And so we tend to rebuild the entire perioral area when we're treating someone's, someone's lips or around their mouth, so. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm just looking for your little mixer. Oh, ew. I know I put it on the table. Oh, there it is. Okay. Here we go. Yeah, we're doing the 11. You ready? Also, um, ooh, this marker likes to stay on. We don't recommend using ice um, after you inject the product just because it's, it can kill the stem cells, it can damage those. And you also don't want to mix any sort of lidocaine, obviously, in the same area that you're injecting because it's cytotoxic to the cell. What do you need? Four by four. Okay. All right, so just, I don't know if this is too painful. So I'm just kind of creating little wheels under the skin. You don't really have to try to be exactly in the line because you're really trying to globally restore that volume. And you're injecting in the same depth as you would filler, correct? Absolutely. If yeah. you were using like a Bellatero HA or one of the more uh, thin fillers with a lower G prime, mm -hmm. I tend to be in that area. Is that, would you, would you concur with that? Yes, yeah. That's what I do around the mouth, yes. You know, I think people start to say line chasing, really, but that's not really what we're doing. No, and I don't think you have to with this product because we are gonna regenerate that skin. So because of that, you're not gonna end up with the same bulkiness that you can end up with other types of fillers that we use around there. I need some more. Do you want a different one? Okay. Do you wanna try this one? I got that for you. Oh, perfect. Thank you. And also, you don't have to really worry about that overfill like you do with a dermal filler. Yes. Also around the mouth, I tend to do what we call the collapse testing because the tissue will tell you where the patient has the deficit. And so a lot of times, especially because I think people's lips are really overdone, she's, she's having a little bit of discomfort when I'm in there. You can do the collapse test of the tissue just to kind of figure out where her deficit is. If you're a more novice injector or you're just, your eyes are playing tricks on you or you're like, well, I know, I know there has to be some, you know, receding of the upper lip, but if you just kind of do the collapse test, the tissue will tell you where she's lacking volume or could use more structure per se in the tissue. And I will also say, I'm not sure that you get as much of this, the post-inflammatory swelling that you do with um, some of the other PRF or PRP products. I feel like some of the other products you get a lot more post-inflammatory swelling. Do you feel that same way? Or? Yeah, they, they definitely get some, but it hasn't been as bad as I've had with other products because I've set all the expectations of my patients to go away looking crazy for two to three days because that's what we usually have to do. They have some, but I haven't had anybody complain that it's been a lot of swelling or they needed time off or anything like that, so. Good. All right, you're almost done with the bad part. So besides using a 30 gauge in the lip, where else do you prefer needles over cannulas when you're injecting, Missy? So if I'm trying to elevate the corners of the mouth, a lot of times I'll use 
um, a needle just to make that the V, mm -hmm. you know, to get the, the corner of the mouth to turn up. It really just depends. Um, a lot of times if I'm doing necklace lines, I prefer a needle uh, over a cannula because I feel like sometimes the cannula is actually bigger than the, than the, you know, the line, line you're trying to fill. And yeah. I wanna be in that superficial space, yeah. just like around the mouth. And almost like little blebs. And sometimes when they leave, they almost look like they've had a, a necklace that's kind of been injected underneath that skin. But that tends to, to, to iron itself out in a couple of days and that doesn't tend to be any sort of problem or need any adjusting so far in my experience. Do you do the same technique or do you use anything different? No, I mean, basically for me, I inject the same way I would filler. So if I use a needle preference in a certain area, I've been using a needle there. And if I use a cannula preference in a certain area, for example, um, like Dr. Thornton was talking about under the eyes, I'm, I'm cannula only under there. Me too. So with I stick product. with that and I've been using that as my same thing. If I'm doing uh, HA filler, I will go super, we, we transfer, we backfill to tuberculin syringes and I will go super periosteal. Um, but with this product, I tend to use the cannula because it just lays so beautifully. And I feel like you can go into different depths of the tissue with just one tool versus changing and doing you know, different mm -hmm. tools for the same area. And of course, if you guys have questions throughout, feel free to ask. We are happy to answer them. Good, here. Um, are you having them massage? What are you doing, Missy? No, I, I lightly it? massage it before they leave. Oops. And then I don't, I don't have them massage. I don't think it's necessary. Yeah. Because um, okay, even there. a couple hours afterwards, they're gonna notice that it just relaxes so much more in the tissue that you don't really have to have the patient do the massaging. A lot of times what they're seeing is just the inflammation from the needle stick. Um, so I don't feel like that they have to, you know, worry about doing that once they leave. And it feels different than filler. Filler, you can you get a lot more stiffness in the tissue. After you inject derma, it really feels kind of soft and supple. You don't mm -hmm. get that firm, stiff feeling that you do. That looks really good. Yes, that one was next, yes. We're getting lucky with our baby girl. And so one of the things I'm doing for her while she's injecting is I'm just kind of agitating a couple syringes back and forth. We let it sit for a while. In my practice, as soon as I get it drawn and mixed up, I like to inject right away, and then I don't have any issues with it being too stiff or having difficulty getting it through a 25 gauge. If you let it sit for a while, which you can, because this nothing's gonna harm it, I do feel like it is a little bit harder to inject. So just make sure you agitate it a little bit then back and forth. So since we were back there with it ready for a while, I just figured I would agitate for her so she doesn't have any difficulty as it gets going. So that's one word of advice. So if you are used to having somebody draw for you, having it prepped for you, having it sit back in that room and then you come in and inject, if it's been there for a little bit, just make sure you agitate. So now I'm actually doing her lip. And so I call it the fencing technique. This will improve you know, the vermilion border, the color of the lip. Oh, I think she has another syringe ready for you. Okay, perfect. Can we agitate this one? So this will do two things. It will really help the color of the lip over time. It really kind of restructures the vermilion border as well. And it doesn't give that ducky, I've had filler in my lips look, which I really like. But if they are prone to swelling there with filler, they will be they will swollen. Swell. Yeah, they will. <laughs> I had it done in my lips and it was, uh, I was a little swollen, but I swell normally with filler, so it wasn't anything unusual. Okay, I was wondering if you had more. Thank you, I'm gonna wait until, yeah. I can also, I'm just gonna switch to a 25, one and a half cannula for her lips. Okay, you got that? Yeah. And then when you're ready, I have one of these. How you doing, Cindy? <laughs> because it's an injection and you're poking the area, it's the same thing. So her question was about cold sores. 
same thing. If they're prone to cold sores because you're poking with a needle, it's not product dependent, you should still do some kind of antiviral because if they will get it with a the filler, then they'll get it with this. But it's more of the needle stick than it is the product. Any questions so far? I mean, very little. I just kind of depends on the, the shape and size of the lips initially. So was her question about volume? Yeah. Okay, so she was asking if there's any certain amount of volume, but it's similar to filler. So I, if you've noticed too, they do come with one cc syringes and Missy might do the same as I do, but I'm tracking it as I go in certain areas, trying to figure out how many cc's I put here, how many cc's I put there. I do document that when I'm done, so I have an idea when the patient comes back, if I'm looking for results and how did this area react versus that, I know exactly how many cc's I put in each area. And so for lips, you know, a lot of times you're gonna be one to two around there. That's all you're really gonna have to use. Same thing with tear troughs. You know, I've done, I think as much as 1.2 on somebody underneath one side, but because you are going to have that gel consistency to it, you don't want to overfill the area. So it's not like a traditional PRP or PRF where you can just flood the area. We're filling more to correction. I've had one patient where um, after the first one, I felt she needed a little bit more. The second one I filled, I told her, I'm gonna fill you a little bit over to correction and I expected her to stay swollen for a week or two underneath there. She didn't, but I set the expectation that she might be and she was okay in order to get the results. So I have had that in a single case, but with all of this, we're looking at more at filling to actual correction. correction. Yeah, there's no need to overfill. And the good news is too, is I feel like they re retain a lot more of the residual fill okay. than and some of the other yeah. uh, PRP or PRF products. So you really can see the patient back in, in that three to four month span and they still have about 80, 85% of their initial fill. It doesn't tend to go away, I don't think as quickly as some of the other. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna do her lower lip on this side. This is enough to do that, no. So did the, with the fencing technique, I do that a lot for dermal, just, just HAs in general, uh, depending on the lip. And I don't, I'm not a huge fan of cannulas in the lips. That's just me. Everyone has kind of their own way that they, you know, technique or style. Um, so I'm just using what I would normally do. Now for the lower lip, because of the pain, I am using a cannula on her. Oh, because oh, based on the uh, where your arm's at, girl. Sorry. <laughs> Just tell me. Move out of the way. Okay. There you go. Just watch your shoulder again. Okay. Let me get in. Yeah, once you hole. get it in. Yeah. yeah okay. There we go. Now she's... The fun part, right? Finding the cannula hole. Okay. Hole at any stage. And honestly, in my practice, I would do lips last, but just because of the coagulation of the derma, I wanted to go ahead and get that out of the way since we're working with a 30 gauge needle. That's never fun to deal with. So she's a little swollen around the, mo the mouth, but The lines are much softer, but I don't really want, do you have them apply ice? I don't have no, them apply No, actually, ice. I tell them not to. That's always been my protocol for any PRP, PRF, any product like this. 
we actually want the immune response. So I tell him, sorry, no ice, no Benadryl, no steroids, you're just gonna go as is. I'm okay with Arnica, um, because I don't think that shuts down any of the immune response. But part of what this is, is looking for that immune response. So I don't wanna do anything that's gonna shut that down. So that's why I've always set the expectation that they're gonna look really swollen because I say no icing. Um, but it has not been as bad as I was expecting initially. I still say that to everybody, right? Because you're gonna get that one patient who has a really dramatic histamine response and they're gonna leave looking crazy for a couple days because there's no ice, no steroids, no Benadryl, no nothing, but um, no. Oh, you're in the way again, there we go. All right, so you on to the tear trough here? So now, now I'm in the- Oh, you're just the temple. No, I'm gonna do the temple now. This is your tear trough. So I'm just gonna add a little bit of volume in the temples. And I like going in more superficially here. I used to go to bone, and it, with radius and, and Sculptra, um, we go to the bone there. But yes. um, with HAs, which I'm not a huge fan of in the, in the temples, um, and with derma, I don't go to the bone. I don't feel like there's a reason to. No. And patients I'm really like shoulder. that because you get a lot more, oh. Sorry. Um, I agree with you. I will still use other products deep on bone there, but instead of using an HA here, I do superficially with a cannula yep. to help hide those vessels too, yep. right? Because in the long term, you want that collagen stimulation, so not a temporary product that's just gonna mask the vascular in there, but the um, collagen that's gonna stimulate and help fill that in for some of your very thin ladies that are older, that are, you know, have that fair type one, type two skin that are just extremely vascular because you get their temple filled in with another product and then they just look like a mask of veins up there. So this product is excellent for that area. So this marker is really like a tattoo on your face. Uh-oh. You're gonna look extra pretty for this weekend. Right. Some purple, some swollen. <laughs> we'll get it off. Here, you want me to hold that? And honestly, in my office, I don't use marker because I want to see what the tissue's doing in case just to look at the color, um, if there's any blanching that's happening. And sometimes I think markings get in the way. So when I'm planning with my patient, I will mark on them, but I usually remove the markings because I want to see how the tissue is in the area that I'm treating is responding. There we go. There we go. An hour. An hour. Yeah. yeah. Same thing. So she asked, how long does it take, you know, from start to finish? I, I think with this, an hour is fair. And the, the, the beautiful thing is, because I just yielded 12 cc's of a filler, per se, in her face, you could charge 35, 4,500 bucks for it. And you're not asking them to come back every four to six weeks, like initially you do when you're doing um, PRP, or when you're asking the patient to come back three times on that four to six week cycle. So they will are willing to pay that amount because it's a one-time treatment and then you're sending them home. And they'll get about four to six months. Now, if you do treat the patient a subsequent time within that four to six week mark, you can increase that longevity to about nine to 10 months. So I get a lot of questions when I'm doing trainings about anti-grade injections. And sometimes I think in this area, if you kind of get stuck or you feel like you're not making progress in the tissue, it's fine to do an anti-grade injection because it just kind of like lubes things up or makes things just more glidable in the tissue. And you really to Dr. Thornton's point, go really superficially and get really close to underneath that eyelid. Mm -hmm. And that's where that crepiness and skin integrity. With a filler, I would never go, an HA, I would never go superficially like this. I don't even care if it, it, it's one of those products that they say that you could yeah. go that superficially with. But with this product, you absolutely can. 
And I almost feel like it's beneficial because of that skin integrity is gonna change so much. So I'm gonna leave the pore in and I'm just gonna add the needle, I'm gonna syringe back on. So once we're in that good glide plane, I just don't wanna have to keep inserting it. Well, and to your point on that, there's very few things that you can address under eyelid aging with that don't have a lot of downtime. And this is one of them, 100%. you know? It's like there's a couple things in our practice that we have for under eyes. And but you know what we're seeing too is even at a year, the fill part of it might be gone, but the skin integrity is still different. Now, when you're doing your derma appointments, if they're coming in, are you doing a neuromodulator same day? I will. Okay. Yeah. Will you? Yeah. Sometimes I will. If I feel like they're really swollen when I'm done around the eyes, I and make no. them come back. Yeah. Yeah. And two, I'm not a big fan because even if you've numbed them with a the topical numbing, if your topical numbing is really strong, I feel like they can't innervate those muscles as much. And so I really want to make sure that my patients can actually show me a good frown or show me a good raise. Yeah. And so a lot of times if I feel like the, you know, they're too numb, I'll yeah. just have them come back. Yep. So that's something to keep in mind too, is you can tell them maybe. <laughs> when they get there, if they're able to, then that's fine. But if you see a lot of swelling that you feel like is going to affect your neuromodulator um, injections, then don't do it same day. Agreed. So this ligament here is always fun to get kind of across. But when I treat patients in my practice under eye, I never really just do under eye. It's an under eye kind of cheek combo because I think you need to ease that transition from that souf or that malar fat pad and extend it beyond down to the cheek. So I really feel you kind of have to blend the two together. So my first couple of passes were a little bit deeper, and then the last couple of passes were more superficial. Oh. It's a little 25, yeah. yeah. It's a one and a half. I didn't know if you had That's a one. That's perfect. Okay. Yep. Yep. So I think when I go down into the cheek, it's below the muscle because it kind of, you, you feel the tethering of that, that ligament there, and so you kind of have to get through it. Um, but you'll see here, this is why it's pretty, because you can really kind of transition that under eye and give them a cheek as well. And your patients are happy. We had a patient come in the other day, she'd lost 20 pounds, and we did full facial contouring with a 22 ml syringe. Literally the next day, you know, when your phone starts going off at seven, you're like either, oh shit, or oh, maybe this is a good thing, or, or who's calling in sick, right? But um, uh, she was texting us pictures in her bathroom in her natural light and was like, I've had, you know, she's been my, our patient for years and she's like, I've had many, many fillers and I'll never ever have a filler again because this is the only thing in the next day. She also has um, an autoimmune disease and so she gets very swollen for a very long time when she does other things and so she was just very impressed with the fact that she looked so good the next day. And I find that they, people tend to not bruise so much with this. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. Maybe I've just I, gotten lucky. Yeah, and I use a cannula most everywhere with this, except for the lip. I'm, I'm still a fan of a needle in the lip. So that might be why in my own personal experience, but yeah, I haven't had a lot of bruising. How are you doing? Just doing this, yeah. I don't think you need other fillers at the same time. I would give this a chance first, and because it yields so much, there's just no need. And because it really has, the, the G prime of it really stands up, it's enough that it gives some body and some oomph, and so you don't necessarily have to layer in something else to give it that structure.
How you doing, Cindy? Good? All right. Yeah. So after this one, you have five and a half left. Perfect. Okay. Yep. I just wanted That'll work. to give you an update. We're almost to that stopping. Which is a good point if you're by yourself. Make sure you're tracking as you go. So whatever you're doing on one side, you're leaving enough for the other side. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I do like to lay mine out as well, so I'm kind of counting. You can even, if you need to, lay it out and say, okay, I think I'm going to use two here, two here, and two here. So you kind of have those laid out on the table. Um, just like I always do with my neuromodulator syringes. And then as you get going, if you want to change things, but at least you're counting as you're going. And I always like to start with the worst side in my practice right. too. And get that up and going just like I would with an HA filler. Okay. You like that sound? I know. Okay. All right. Sounds like we're getting our next set of models ready back there. Hear all the beeping going off. All right. So now we're just going to do a little bit in the lower face in the pre kind of jowl sulcus area. And we're gonna kind of build, and God forbid I'm not using one of those markers again because I give her a microdermabrasion at the same time. Um, I'm just gonna kind of fan down here with a little bit for just restoration around the mouth. I'm gonna come from the other side because that's where I All right. Now when I inject in my office, I use the 25 gauge one and a half inch cannulas in some areas. I do use 22 gauge two inch cannulas. I am one of those who likes those. So um, you are fine if you want to use larger cannulas. Missy was injecting with a 30 gauge needle. I had not tried that yet. I was using 27s around the mouth and lip area. So you just kind of have to think about like what are you doing with filler and what do you, um, how would you normally inject that area? But I had stuck with a 27. I might have to try a 30 just because that is a little bit nicer around the lips. You just have to have a mixer because it does yeah. tend to coagulate a little or bit. Or get going right away. Yes, get so going right away. That's right the away. other thing. But it does a nice job in those superficial rides. I really feel like it just is like butter. It just kind of knows where to go in the tissue. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, we can definitely do that. Have her sit up. Sit up, yeah. And Just, you'll have to, no, face the camera. To, so turn around behind you. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe stand, there you go. So she's a bit swollen here, but did you can see the entire kind of side of her face is picked up just from revolumizing the temple, the cheek, and this perioral side of the, that side of her face. Yeah. <laughs> I'm actually going to go back to her temple instead. Okay. Just that's where I like to start. Good. Thank you. 
Do you want me to hold anything for you while you do that? I'm just attacked 25, by a and a half. <laughs> um, I like dermis fold. Yeah. I mean, I think if you probably closed my eyes and just gave me a cannula, I wouldn't be, wouldn't really know, but I do tend to gravitate towards those. So I know another question that I do occasionally get asked is, um, when you are using a needle, do you ever aspirate when you're with this? Or do you feel like it's difficult to aspirate with this product? Do you think it's difficult to aspirate? I don't think it's, hmm? I don't think it's difficult to aspirate. No, I don't. I'm just saying it's a question I've been getting. So it I'm depends on the area of the opinion. face that I'm going. Like here, yes, absolutely. Near the hairline, I'm going to aspirate. Yeah. No, I noticed you were, so that's why I was throwing that out. Because yeah. I've had that question come up and things. And, you know, what I was trying to explain is uh, just depending on where this, you feel like this falls in the, the G prime scale, if you feel like you can aspirate thicker products on the higher G prime scale, then yes, you would you be can. able to aspirate yeah. this. That's and, and you know, to the, the point that was spoken of earlier, anything thicker than water, you need to be conscientious and, and aspirate. Yeah. yeah. You what? Oh. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Here we go. Is that a blog thing? I heard it was about this one. This one is we'll remix this one. Okay. Might be the cannula. Let me know because I can grab you another one. Is that better for you? I think it might be my cannula. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. I think we only have two inches up here. That's fine, I can make it work. Okay. There you go. Still, just a clogging point. Probably because we're down to the last one. Yeah, it's okay. I'm gonna get her clean. Okay. Talk a little bit more, and we can keep mixing that a little bit. Yeah. And how, how cold is your
this one's just a little bit big. Do you want a 22 for that area or you want to stick with the 25? 25. Okay. Just to make it challenging. Mm -hmm. We're almost done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No. Mm -mm. No, you do with in the upper face, though, I feel like more. So what was her question? Do you want to ask it again? Yes. Yeah. I haven't Not, seen that. I don't know. So she was asking because she said in her past experience using like PRP or PRF, if she injected one area, it seemed like other areas of skin also got a glow or looked better. And if we had seen that. Not necessarily, it's, I'm, it's possible that we haven't been looking for it, but also using 12, 10 to 12 cc's, I feel like we cover so many areas, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure if that's something that I've noticed with the product. Okay, perfect. So I don't totally, yeah. So her question is, is there a limit to how many mLs you can put in the tear trough? I have typically been filling to correction versus overfilling. I've had one patient that I did need to overfill a little bit on, but it would be more of like, if I thought she needed 1.2 cc's per side, I would put 1.4. So it's not the same amount where I am going to extreme differences, um, where it's almost like a, PRP or PRF where you're just flooding it with like, you know, two plus mLs per side. I'm not necessarily doing that. Are you ready for this one? Yeah. Okay. There you go. So no, it's more fill to correction. I have not been doing upper I eyelids. I heard either. that today. I know, right? Makes you... Yeah, I have not put it there yet. I have definitely hit crow's feet on the outer edge, so I've done that. Of course, the under eyes, upper lip, nasolabial folds, marionettes, um, preauricular hollows, and like any of the smile lines, anywhere that the texture's been bad. I did put it in a glabella line with a cannula. We're just gonna do it around our mouth and we're done. So. All right. Yes. She's got, I'm gonna do a little bit more in this cheek. Are you, are you recommending like three sessions every three months, something like that? I've been doing one to two sessions, spacing them six to eight weeks apart, so. And then just waiting to see what Yep, and then waiting from there, yeah. And then as far as depth, are you staying pretty superficial? Do you go super periosteal for some of the? I really haven't been going super periosteal because I really yeah. want that dermis. You want, want that skin integrity to yes. change and be affected. And I sure. want as much, fibroblast activities I possibly can get. And I was actually at a um, Galderma dinner last night and there was a discussion on, you know, the fact that a lot of us will put sculpture down on the bone and it has the indication for that, but there's actually very minimal studies on sculpture showing the activity there, even though we seem to see it clinically working. So the same thing, because the primary studies are gonna be in that dermal to subdermal layer, where we know we're gonna get the fibroblast activity, that's where I've been putting it. So I haven't necessarily been going to bone. But it doesn't mean you can't try it, because there is the potential to get fibroblast activity there. So. And of course the gel's gonna give you the immediate fill anyways. So, and because this one is, it tends to be a good G prime, you will get the lift. Probably. So my thing is with my patients, it's always kind of like areas one, two, three, four, five, and if I have some left and they need some down somewhere, I'm just gonna stick it there because you gotta put it somewhere. 
I've been doing needle there. So for upper lip line, she was asking cannula or needle. I'm a needle with filler there, so I'm doing a needle with this product there. Um, but nasolabial folds, marionettes, I've been cannula. Um, the smile lines going back, I've been needle because I like a needle better there. I feel like I can get into each little piece that I need to, and I feel like this product works really good there. So we're just gonna finish up this lower part of her, of her marionette line and just kind of, and then we can sit her up and take a look and then Robert, are you gonna? Will you scoot your body a little bit further back on the pillow? Like scoot your butt, yep. yep. I mean, it, in the beginning when we were playing with it I was, but no, not necessarily. Yeah. Yeah. Or thereabouts. You know, it has varied a little bit. So yeah. I think you guys are going to go over more of what they're setting for standard pricing, correct? Yeah, the standard pricing we've seen kind of since launching. For the larger kit, it's been Sorry, pretty well accepted, about 3,500. Um, accounts in Dallas and kind of every market has really, that's been really receptive. Some are doing a little more in higher end markets. Um, I've seen up to 4,000 for the higher, for the larger kit. And then kind of cut that in half for the, for the smaller kit, so mm -hmm. any, you know, anywhere. I've seen it as low as 1,000, but 1,500 you know, to 1,800 has been pretty well accepted for yeah. the smaller yep. smaller kit. I so. would agree with that. Mm -hmm. you wouldn't re I wouldn't do any less than 1,500. No, I wouldn't. Kit. I mean, for the amount of work you're doing, I would not do any less than 1,500, yeah. not by any means. And you could probably, Whole I have some accounts that do 2,000 for that smaller Cause the kit, because you're getting you and I can't. five, sometimes seven cc's. There you go. So you can do Perfect. a good correction yes. still. So. Okay, turn towards me just a little bit. Here yes. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Just like I would filler. I would just scarlet first, and then I would inject this afterwards. Yeah. Just watch your shoulder again, girl. So we're going to finish up uh, this kind of last injection. We'll sit her up. We'll take... Um, we have it pre pretty much ready to set, so our, our proctors will go to the tables. We'll get, uh, some are already injecting, but we'll, we'll get you guys going, um, those of you who are doing the hands-on. We'll take like a quick five minute break here in a minute, mm -hmm. and then uh, we'll start running through the patients. So the next round of patients, we can probably go ahead and get their blood drawn during that break and get it spun down so we're ready for, for the next iteration, so. There we go. Any other questions while we're finishing up here? No. It's that nope. a toxic to the stem cells, so you would yeah. not yeah. want to do that. Mm -mm. Yeah, the, that's, the no, question so was, would you ever add lidocaine to it? And uh, yeah. that is. So keep that in mind when you are doing lips and upper lip area. It does not get better as you go. It yes. gets worse. Yes. <laughs> Just like the way the HA fillers used to be before there was lidocaine in it. Yeah. The only thing I will do is when I'm using a cannula, I'll use a little bit of Lido with Epi at my ports where I'm gonna go in with a cannula and that's it. So. Yeah. You can cover your port holes just like I did with her, um, just to make her a little bit more vasoconstricted there. Mm -hmm. um, and as you see some areas, she's still bled a little bit. Um, do you need one more? Okay, you can, take a, you can sit up and we'll take a look. Is that just in case? Yes, right? So, and off camera, we can, I think she needs a little bit, tiny bit more right here mm -hmm. on this cheek area. Yeah. You have one more CC, so yeah. that's perfect. So we'll have, you know, but around the and mouth, point too. she needs a little bit more here too. And we have another syringe, so we're going to use it. We do, it, so. yeah. Yeah. We actually have 1.3, which is nice. It's kind of nice to stop and look at your patients every now and then and be like, okay, I need a little bit more here, I need yeah. a little bit more there. I would say it's like uh, when, you know, when you get down to your last syringe, it should be like when you're down to your last like 0.2 in an HA syringe. Take it's a like look, 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 look yeah. in the areas and be like, ooh, it really needs to go there before you just start, you know, sticking it places. Because sometimes in your younger patients, which you will get as well, right? Tear trough areas can be in younger patients, especially that hyperpigmentation, the vascular ones. So then you really have to figure out where am I gonna put it? And yeah. Missy brought up a good point, necklace lines, right? So some of these younger patients, even if they're late 20s, have that tech neck going on. Mm -hmm. And this is a great option for that area that's yes. not gonna bulk up their neck, but can go after those necklace lines as well as hands. So there's all kinds of places that you can put it. 
So, um, decollete lines. Anyway. Have you done any um, <clears throat> acne scarring or, or cellulite? I haven't, cellulite but yet uh, yes, you like could that? do that. Yeah. yeah. I have done um, a couple dimples in a butt on a cellulite. So I did do that. I didn't do like the overall, mm -hmm. but I did a few dimples down in there. You could definitely do that though. Perfect. Because anywhere that you would put, put other chair. products, sure. because you're going to get that collagen stimulation, you can definitely do that. Yeah, so there is there is some, um, in Europe, they've been utilizing it pretty pretty vastly for the past couple of years before Oop. we introduced it here in the U.S. And uh, on the scarring, they were putting it underneath, the, you know, the kind of those dimpled acne scars. And because you get really good stimulation, you're, you're kind of healing that scar from the inside out. You know, and obviously you can treat it from the top down with like scarlet or microneedling as well. What's your question? Oh, I said unless you want to. Here, let me get it to you. You're fine. For anyone who's using this for acne scars, um, are you doing it maybe kind of like that new sculpture method where you are subsizing first? Yes. And then putting your... Even um, for static wrinkles, you can absolutely do that as well. Yes. You do the subcision with your needle and then lay the product in and it's beautiful. Yes. And then they're going to get collagen stimulation from dual modalities, yeah. right? From subcision and then from putting something in there that's going to actually cause a collagen product to work, you know, to grow back to where it was. So you get that double scaffold effect by doing that. Yeah, which is also sometimes nice about using cannulas in certain areas because you can subsize that whole area. But acne scarring occasionally is so tethered that you almost need a needle to cut it. All right, so she is done. I'm done beating up on her. Let me just relax. I mean, so she oh, yeah. does have a little swelling in the cheeks, um, but really we did full facial contouring from temples, under eye, transition oh, to the cheek, um, marionette lines, vertical righted, upper lip, lower lip, and then in this uh, submalar area as well. So, so we'll give you a, we'll give her some repair for that swelling. That'll help yeah, dissipate we'll that. There's some right here. So. Perfect. <clears throat> so that was uh, 12 cc's is what we injected. Perfect. So. All right, so what we're going to do now is... Um, We'll take a quick, you know, five-minute bio break. Um, the next uh, set of people, uh, our station starting in the back on my right, your left. That's one, two, three, and then four, five, six. So they start over here, and one, two, three, four, five, six. And uh, we can get the next set of people set up for your blood draw. And um, any of the injectors, if you have questions, we're going to have proctors at each station as well. So. We'll go ahead and break now, and then we'll get you guys set up at each station, and we'll get through the next iteration of patients. All right? Thank you. Yeah. Oh, you just used to ride. I like to dance, and it looks like this. I like to dance, and it looks like this. Uh, I like to pop and lock. And hit you with a little bit of robots. Gotta hit it, get it, love it, live it. Get a little silly with the lyrical ridiculousness. I like to shake a leg. I like to nod my head. I like to walk into a party with a pirouette. A little more goes a long way. Like a soul train line in a hallway. It's your way, my way, all day. My kind of magic. 